Animals have been banging for at least half a billion years, and yet very little direct evidence of such acts exist in the fossil record. What's up with that? Well, those tissues which become hard are actually soft tissues, and they rarely ever fossilize. However, they sometimes do under very special circumstances, and one of the oldest known instances of this is quite revealing. Hey, while I have your attention, I have two other channels you should check out when you get a chance. Edge of Reality is where I talk about cryptids and the paranormal, anything that is creepy, crawly, and outside of the realm of science. Edge's World of Monsters is where I tackle basically anything fictitious, whether that be kaiju or dragons. The vast majority of fish alive today reproduce externally. They have a tube for the sperm or eggs which connects internally with the tube that releases urine. Both of these tubes connect to the outside of the animal via a urogenital opening right before the anus. The external part here is the fact that they don't have penises to stick into cloacae, urogenital openings, or vaginas. Instead, the female squirts out her boba pearls into the water column or a protected area, and then the male splurges his love juice into the water column so that it spreads out and falls onto the eggs. From there, the sperm fertilizes the eggs, all outside of the bodies of both adult sexes. However, this is not the case for all non-tetrapodal vertebrates that swish around in the world's water bodies. The males of most cartilaginous fish, which aren't particularly closely related to the low-finned or ray-finned fish, are packing a pair of Johnson-like organs called claspers that jut out of the pelvic fins. The male's clasper is a curled-up half-tube that helps to direct the baby batter trail into the female's cloaca. This is therefore a form of internal fertilization. Chimeras are the last lineage of one of the oldest groups of cartilaginous fish, the holocephalans. These critters are extremely bizarre with their genitals. They usually have three types of claspers. The first clasper is on the forehead and lets the male better attach himself to the female. The second clasper is placed in front of the pelvis and is a serrated hook for further locking the male to the female. The last one is the seed spewer and is basically the same as the claspers in sharks, but it's harder and more fused. The term fish is mostly an informal one because the various groups of critters we call fish are not super closely related to one another. They're all technically related in a broad sense because all animals share a common ancestor if you go back far enough. In this case though, how far back does the penis-like organ go? Is the primitive condition that of most bony fish alive today, spewing out the eggs and sperm willy-nilly? Or is it closer to the sharks, with a positive and negative receptacle? Unfortunately, the answer is broadly vague and difficult to answer with 100% certainty because the genitals are usually some of the softest parts of most critters. However, as I just pointed out, some things like the chimeras have reinforced naughty bits, so maybe some do survive the onslaught of deep time. The oldest jawed fish were the placoderms, which showed up around 439 million years ago. Cartilaginous fish showed up around the same time, but these forms were much older than any lineage alive today, so they are often separated from the cartilaginous fish when it comes to comparing origin times, hence why placoderms are still considered older. The first cartilaginous fish were the acanthodians, the spiny sharks, though they were not sharks. There were also fish-like critters in the oceans before the placoderms and cartilaginous fish, but they were jawless. Despite there being older fishy things in the oceans, the oldest known direct fossil evidence of vertebrate reproduction was preserved in the remains of the jawed placoderms. Evidence of bony, clasper-like organs in placoderms have been known to science for many decades. They have been found in the Arthrodirans, Ostropicodus, in Cisoscutum, and others. Something like these structures have also been found in the Antiarch placoderm Parayunanolepis. But the very best and oldest example were identified in the 393 million year old genus Microbrachius, which was a member of the Antiarch order of placoderms. Microbrachius has been known to science since Scottish prehistoric fish fiend Ramsay Traquair 
named the animal in 1888. Since then, four species have been named based off of many specimens from Scotland, Belarus, Estonia, and China. A paper was published in 2014 by a multinational team of scientists that describes specimens of the very first species named, Microbrachius dickei, which preserved the bony genital plates of males and females. Thanks to the very high sample size, this research team was able to have a wide range of differences in the genital plates to compare and contrast with known specimens within this species, with specimens of other species within the same genus, genitals preserved in other fossil placoderms, as well as living fish genitalia. The fossils show that the male carried a pair of hook-shaped plates sticking out of the back and underside of the armored box that encased the majority of the body of these animals. These plates projected backwards and out to the sides and were covered in outward projecting spiny ornaments. In contrast, the female carried a pair of blunted blade-shaped plates that surrounded what is assumed to be the cloaca. Some smaller individuals had smaller and less ornamented genital plates that corresponded to both sexes, indicating these were truly sexual organs that developed as the animals aged. Microbrachius also carried a pair of arm-like pectoral fins encased in hard bony armor. There was a joint where the arm attached to the body and in the elbow. In Microbrachius, the armor of the lower arm has backwards pointing spines, so the author team that found the genitalia hypothesize the male and female swam up next to each other and locked arms together to better embrace while the male inserted his hooked claspers into the female's cloaca. In a way, the arms were analogous to the weird non-penis claspers of the living chimeras. The armor of the placoderms would have been covered in skin or some sort of hardened tissue like the stuff that makes up scales or horns, keratin, or some derivation therein. This is extended to the bony claspers, which wouldn't have been purely naked bones sticking out of the animal. Instead, the authors think there may have been a tube for the sperm to run down going through the male plate. From there, there would have been some sort of tissue covering the rest of the bone. The bone was just the internal structure. This is technically the oldest verifiable evidence of intimate sexual intercourse between two vertebrate animals. How touching. However, there's more. This find has some other, more far-reaching implications. You see, lots of paleontologists hypothesized that external fertilization was the primitive condition for vertebrates, with internal fertilization evolving later. It was hypothesized that external fertilization could not have evolved from internal fertilization. However, finding internal fertilization all the way back in these very early placoderms, and then also in the cartilaginous fish, suggests that internal fertilization came first, and then external fertilization evolved independently later. I think a lot of non-scientists who like learning about prehistory may prioritize the evolution of groups of animals over time, dinosaurs but the evolution of various major biological functions and organs is even more important to the greater understanding of life on Earth. The evolution of the eye, for example, is incredibly well documented and it occurred very early on in the evolution of life. The complexity of the eyes of many animals today sometimes creates the misunderstanding that it would be highly improbable for such complex structures to have evolved. The simple answer to this conundrum is, it simply happened slowly over time. A crappy spot that can tell the difference between lightness and darkness is far better than no eye at all, and so on and so forth. However, sticking to just our current topic, the evolution of sex itself helps us understand the hows and whys to our very existence. And if that ain't romantic, I don't know what is. Oh, also this video is inspired by an entry in Dr. Dean Lomax's book, Locked in Time. Check it out when you get a chance. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.